In today's podcast, I'm going to explain a very interesting concept that is going to be plaguing all candidates that are starting their case preparation right now. So starting your case preparation in August, in my opinion, it's doable, but it's hard if you're doing it alone. If you're practicing with someone who understands how to teach cases and an experienced consultant, not just a consultant at McKinsey, but a consultant at McKinsey that knows how to teach cases and how to guide you, I think you'll be okay. I think starting in September, your case preparation, even if you have guidance, is going to be very difficult. But the point is that Canada is starting now and in September, unless you have guidance, what's going to happen to you is that you're going to be trying to do as many cases as possible, asking for as much detailed feedback as possible. In fact, I can even see how these calls go. We have candidates calling up all the time and saying, you know, will you be willing to do a practice session with me? And rarely, I take the calls and I say, okay, yeah, sure, why not? I have an hour booked here over lunch. If you're willing to talk to me while I'm you know, in a restaurant, I'll be happy to do it with you. Those are rare, right? I don't have many sessions where I eat lunch outside of the hotel. Usually it's a Friday, so it's a Friday session. And I'll do the session with the candidate. And the candidate always starts by saying, Michael, give me as much detailed feedback as you possibly can. And of course, I give very detailed feedback. But one of the things I also do at the end is I always prioritize the feedback. And I tell the candidate, okay, I've given you a lot of feedback. These are the three things I want you to focus on. If you focus on only these three things and you show about a 30% improvement in each of them by the time you do your next sessions, you will be far ahead of the pack. Now, the reason why I do this is very simple. I think a lot of candidates are drowning in feedback. I mean, you're getting all kinds of feedback from different people. Not only are you getting feedback that's contradictory, it is always going to be contradictory. You get two pain people, but from the same office, same level of the company, you ask them to give you a case, they'll give you different feedback, and the feedback will even be contradictory, right? And why is the feedback contradictory? Well, it's not really contradictory because you're getting different cases. And if you're getting different cases, you may respond to them in different ways. In fact, you obviously will respond to them in different ways. And therefore, the feedback will be a derivative of your response. And therefore, the, if your response is different, the feedback will be different. And candidates can never understand this. They always come back to me and say, well, this person said I was structured. This person said I was terrible. And how do I reconcile that? Well, you did different cases. That's how you reconcile it, right? But that doesn't obviously help you because the more feedback you get and the more detail you get, the more confused you get. And I can just imagine candidates doing cases over Skype or in person, and they're busy scribbling out the feedback that they are receiving, and they're trying to hit every single minor point. Even if it's some little minor comment about the speed at which they progress or the way they introduce concepts, even if it's a really minor point, the candidate will write it down and they'll say, okay, how do I improve this? And what I find candidates doing is that they're drowning in this feedback because they don't know how to prioritize it, and they don't know what is really useful. Let me give an example of what I mean by what is really useful, right? Let's use the analogy of a 10-year-old that comes from, let's say, I don't know, South Africa, maybe. Let's assume this candidate, this child, is given a calculus equation to solve. Now, if the child gets the calculus equation wrong, you can give that child an enormous amount of feedback, right? All of it valid. The child doesn't know how to work out part X, part Y. The child's structuring is wrong, blah, blah, blah. You can go on forever. Right. But the part of the feedback that's missing is that, is the child ready to do calculus? If the child is ready to do calculus and the child fails at doing calculus, then the feedback would be different than if the child was not ready to do calculus but was given to do calculus, right? So the point I'm trying to make is that when you are at the beginning of your case preparation, you should only do easy questions. If you get easy questions, you know the feedback you are getting are going to address the structural technique problems you have in the way you solve cases. If you get difficult questions that you're not ready for, like this child who's not ready for calculus, when you get feedback, you don't know where you failed. That is too many variables in terms of where you failed. So the first piece of advice I'd give you is that when you're doing cases, don't start with the most difficult cases. Never ever tell someone, give me difficult cases and see how I respond. You're just setting yourself up for miserable failure. Always start simple, work your way out into more and more complex questions, right? And when you get feedback, Always ask for the interviewer to prioritize it. person you're practicing with, ask them to prioritize the feedback and tell you what are the top two or three things you need to improve, right? And take this in stride. For example, telling someone they need to be more structured is tantamount to telling them nothing. If someone tells you you need to be more structured, ask them for specific examples where you are not structured, right? And ask them for an example of what good structure would look like there. Now, candidates know whenever they make a mistake with us in a call. 
they always try to move quickly away from the mistake because they don't want to discuss a mistake, right? They want to say, hey, yeah, I don't worry, I understand what to do. And they know that we never let them move away from the mistake. We spend a lot of time discussing it. I will ask them, why did you do this? Why did you do this when you could have done this? What logical reason would there be for you to say this when this information was available? Why, did it, why was it more natural for you to say this, which was wrong, when most people would have said this, which was right? And Candace think we're picking, but we're not picking. What we want to do is we want to understand why they made the mistake. Why you made the mistake is more important than the mistake you made. In fact, knowing what mistakes you made are kind of irrelevant. It's like telling someone you need to be faster. Well, obviously, they're not trying to be slow. So telling them you need to be faster is the mistake you're making. But why you are slow is more important than the fact that you are slow. So when you're getting feedback, ask for the reasons. Ask for this, you know, why am I not structured? But of course, there are some questions the interviewer can never ask. If you're slow, the interviewer can never tell you why you're slow. That's an internal technique that you've got to develop. Once you get that feedback, right, and you've prioritized it, only focus on the top three priorities, right? Again, it's the 80-20 rule, right? Don't focus on development areas that are going to give you a little return. Focus on those major development areas that are going to give you the largest return. And even a 20% improvement in the top three areas for improvement is much better than completely solving a development area that has a minor consequence on the case. And I do have candidates whereby they will spend all the time focusing on the minor points. And I have some candidates who will tell me, Michael, I've listed everything that I need to improve and I'm focusing on everything in this case. And because they're focusing on everything, their mind is so heavily focused on getting 27 out of 27 points correct that they actually lose track of the case and communication and they introduce other errors. You must never do that. You're never going to be perfect. You have to be good enough. When you get feedback, understand the feedback. When someone tells you you need to be structured and so on, just walk away. They're telling you nothing. And most times, people don't even know what structured means. They just tell you that because they know it sounds, they sound intelligent and they sound as if they thought this through when they tell you that. So you must ask for very clear feedback. What do you mean by structure? Give me an example. Where did I fail? How could I have done this better? Right? If the person can explain that to you in simple English without confusing you, then obviously they know what they're talking about. If they cannot do it, then just ignore them and move on to someone else. And once you get your feedback, prioritize it. You must always focus on the top three things, right? Always focus on the top three things. And when you do an unusual case, like a pricing case, understand the underlying technique. Don't memorize the approach. Understand the underlying technique and see how you could apply it to a different case.